Good afternoon and uh, welcome to a um, webinar in um, systems supporting the ethical management of uh, research data. Uh, my name is Paul Wong. I'm your host today and my colleague uh, Natasha Simons uh, from Sunny Brisbane is uh, co-hosting today a webinar with me. Uh, this webinar is part of a uh, webinar series in research data information integrations. Key theme of this webinar series is the concept of um, research data management life cycle. As you can see, we've changed the color from blue to orange because we've uh, I've changed the um, PowerPoint template. This is our new new look from, from Australian National Data Service. The first webinar we had um, about a month ago was on uh, data management planning tools and um, we have recorded that those webinars and uh, it is uh, available on uh, our YouTube channel but we also have uh, information um, relating to the um, research data information integration webinar series on our website. RD2, not to be confused with R2D2, uh, is really about um, helping the sectors to think through what needs to be done in order to have better management and, uh, of research data across institution systems. So um, the YouTube channel that I mentioned is uh, www.youtube.com user AMS data and as you can see uh, we have created a playlist for the research data information integrations and in that playlist you'll find the, uh, the videos for the um, data management planning tools uh, videos. For those who are interested um, we also have uh, a web co-host a webinar uh, about uh, two weeks ago uh, with NHMRCs on uh, human research ethics applications and that video is also available on the YouTube channel. Uh, it's on the NHMRC channel with that address or, or alternatively you can just, just go, go into YouTube and do a, a search on NHMRC uh, Hurray. So we would like to uh, acknowledge our partner sponsors, the Australasian Research Management Society, as well as the Council of Australian University Librarians. Um, also our uh, sponsor, uh, the ANCRIS program from uh, the uh, Commonwealth uh, Government. Um, I'm happy to announce that our next webinar in the series uh, is scheduled uh, to be broadcast uh, in late mid-July. We'll take a break from our school holidays in, in uh, late June, early July. So currently uh, it's scheduled on the 21st of July uh, at 12 noon. Further details about that web webinar will be sent out um, uh, later on. Uh, the next webinar will be on data storage for research data. Just a little bit about today's audience. Very interesting to see that 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 uh, we begin to to ask uh, um, register um, participant to provide uh, details of the job title, and we did a bit of quick analysis in terms of where where they're from within the institutions. As you can see. Um, the majority of, of you are from the research office, uh, in particular uh, the integrity side of, of research office, but also the reporting side, followed by uh, library have a, have a, have a short, strong showing too. I, looking at this graph, it's interesting to note that just the variety of, of participants within this group. And I would like to just take this opportunity to, to reiterate a point that, that I think um, Ames has been making in the past. Uh, data management, research data management in particular, is very much a shared responsibility within institutions. And the interest that, that uh, has been demonstrated through our audience today uh, show that, that that is indeed the case. It is a shared re responsibility between research office, libraries, uh, IT, uh, as well as academics and e-research and policies area. So, without Further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our very distinguished group of uh, speakers today. 
uh, from three different universities, Dr. Garrett, uh, Gary Allen from Griffith University, um, uh, Jim Lewis from, from RMIT, uh, Glenn Stinger from uh, uh, UniSA, and Angelica uh, uh, from um, UniSA. So although I serve on a few committees with uh, nominees from the ARC and HMRC and Universities of Australia, I'm not speaking on behalf of those august bodies. So any opinions I express are definitely my own. So what I do to start off with is really talking about sort of the brass tacks when we're thinking about data. So um, generally um, we're thinking about the way in which is um, accessed, collected or generated. And, and the, that data can be in a variety of forms. So it might be documents or survey responses. It might be test results or some sort of audio visual files. It could be a range of information. Um, when we're talking about personal information, that might be individually identifiable. And these are the terms that the national statement uses. So it can be individually identifiable or re-identifiable. So we're talking about something that may be as coded where the researchers have got access to the code key. And then non-identifiable. So that might be coded by an agency that's supplying it to the researchers, but the researchers don't actually have the code key. Or all of the identifying information has been stripped out. So it's anonymous. And I think it's worthwhile pausing in terms of sensitive personal information because information is not sensitive personal if it's just because it's humiliating or embarrassing or might expose people to risk. Because the Privacy Act actually defines very clearly what's considered sensitive information. You know, the, the Privacy Act actually closely defines what's considered to be personal information. And so when um, we're asking participants to give their consent, that consent might be specified for a particular project or a particular use, a particular group of researchers, or it might be extended in terms of sort of future research by that team that's in a related area, or it might be unspecified, so it might be a general consent for the research use of their information. And we need to think about information both in terms of when it was access collected or generated. We need to think about then during the course of the research um, where it's being stored or how it's being communicated between collaborating researchers and then after the study. And then finally in terms of how it's going to be disclosed or shared, whether or not it's going to be added to a repository or bank in some way, if it is it actually going to be a feature of the output for the research. So a single project actually might involve sort of multiples of all of those settings in terms of things like the form of the data, the, whether or not their personal information, the degree of, to which they're identified, and then things like the types of consent that's obtained. So you might actually have multiple settings um, for different data across the project. But I think it's important to re reiterate to everybody that just because research involves uh, ethical sensitivities or risks, it, it doesn't mean that research is compromised or it's a problem. You know, quite often the fact that there's ethical challenges for research is actually an indicator that it's perhaps very important, that it's going to make some sort of social or, or broader contribution. And so we should be embracing when the research involves those challenges, not trying to avoid them. So you know, the fact that there are ethical concerns, that's not a reason to say that the research isn't valid or to say that we shouldn't be accessing or sharing of data. Um, it just maybe means that we require a bit more precautions or um, arrangements in place. And for individual researchers, you need to be prepared for the fact that the, the group of people that are reviewing your research might not actually be that familiar with you know, your research design or the topic area. So it may well be that you need to sort of engage with the reviewers to explain the reasons for the research, explain what the benefits are, explain about the data sharing and be ready to justify your approach and take an educative role in terms of those reviewers. And I'm not talking about it being confrontational, although it's been known to happen, but you know, there should be that sort of engaged discussion between researchers and reviewers. But you know, with some careful preparation, it's possible to avoid delays or problems with the research ethics review of a piece of work and the sharing of data. So when you're thinking about sort of research ethics and research integrity of your data, there's a few things to think through quickly. So the guidance in terms of human research ethics can be found in the national statement 
and in terms of research integrity, it can be found in the Australian Code. And both of those documents have got content on a particular point when we're talking about this issue. So matters like privacy, consent and risk, you'll find across those two documents. And currently there's reviews underway in terms of both the National Statement and the Australian Code. And I should fess up that I'm involved in uh, the review of the National Statement. So there are updates going on and there's public consultations coming. So as a group it's important that you keep out your eye out for that and you have input as the reviews are going on. For those of you that may be a base outside of Australia or doing research outside of Australia, there's comparable documents in other jurisdictions. And in fact, over the course of the last decade, there's increasingly research ethics and research integrity frameworks in sort of continental Europe, um, in Africa, Southeast Asia and beyond. So you know, we may need to actually refer to those documents in the other jurisdictions. So in terms of the frameworks, I've a couple of implications. One is the collection of the data and then the use and maybe sharing the data is it will likely to be considered human research, particularly if it's identified information and so require some research ethics review. And it may well imply to sort of existing data sources, so the material from the web or social media. And hopefully your institutional frameworks give you some advice in terms of whether or not it's considered human research. And so then because of that you need to be thinking about the consent that you obtain and whether or not it's specified, extended or unspecified and what that consent allows for. You need to think about the degree to which that information is identifiable. So is it directly identified in terms of individuals? Is it possible that individuals could be identified by inference, including what um, you know, in, within social media there's, sorry, social science research increasingly there's reflection on what we call internal identification. So if for instance you were talking to about a group of research ethics bureaucrats and you said that you spoke to a bureaucrat that gets around in a wheelchair and is in his 40s and is losing his hair, you may not have said my name but people that work in the sphere will know that you're talking about me. And sometimes that internal identification can be more problematic than sort of a sort of general population identification. So we need to be reflecting in terms of are there risks associated with the degree to which people could be identified? Are there risks associated with uh, the release of that information? I think it's important to recognise that there will be groups of people that won't be concerned if they're identified. It may well be that there's a situation that you're talking about people that are relatively senior that will be very able to look after their interests and I'm concerned. But that's likely to be a project specific reflection. And tied to that, there will be some participants who will demand to be identified. If you're talking about sort of activists on a particular issue, it may be a condition of them providing their information is that they will be identified. So that's something that you need to accommodate. So when you're seeking consent for the research use of information, there's a few things that you need to really cover. So, you know, there are things you need to include, so, you know, thinking ahead in terms of the sharing, banking and research use, reuse of that information. So, is it going to be added to a repository? And talking about the degree to which it's going to be identifiable and really anticipating in terms of and whether or not in terms of that consent, the degree of specificity about how that information might be used for other research or shared for other purposes. Being careful not to embed research consent into other consent. So if you're doing research in an area like um, language support for international students, you don't want to embed the research con consent into the process for a person volunteering to receive some support. Making sure that you, you, you provide details of a withdrawal mechanism so participants know what they need to do to withdraw their consent later so that the data could be um, removed from the banking or uh, repository. Um, and then thinking about the mechanism by which other researchers will access that data. So will it be that they're accessing it in an identified form or what is the custodian, what's the custodian's role in terms of that access? And you know, really in terms of whether or not the other researchers will see it in an identified form identifiable or not identifiable. Obviously it's really important to make sure that you're keeping good records. So the systems that we're talking about in the uh, workshop today are I guess examples of what the ways in which you can record the information. 
So if you all forgive some shameless self-promotion, but um, you don't really have any choice because I'm the one with the mic. But um, along with a couple of colleagues of mine, so uh, Colin Thompson, Mark Israel, and Martin Tollett from New Zealand, uh, we maintain a couple of uh, free resources for researchers. So one of them is a resource library that includes a variety of documents, and then also there's a Research Ethics Monthly blog. So both of those talk about research ethics and research integrity. I definitely encourage you to uh, drop by and have a look at those resources. Thank you, Gary. Uh, yeah, there's one question. So um, thank you very much, Gary. And we've got uh, 78 uh, connections on the line at the moment, just to let you speakers, presenters know. Um, a question of what is the time frame for the review of the national statement and which body is overseeing the review? Okay. I mean, that's a really good question because, first of all, it's important to stress that the review bodies are including people from uh, the ARC, Universities of Australia and NHMRC and various nominees. So, you know, there, there's a real attempt underway to make sure that it's an inclusive approach to speak to the right wide gamut of research designs. The actual review of the national statement, it's an ongoing rolling review. Um, there's um, material that's being released progressively, so that's why uh, last year we saw the um, uh, opt-out approach to recruitment and consent was released as part of that rolling review. Um, the next block of material which um, I've been involved in hopefully will appear before the end of this year um, and public consultation will um, happen well before that. In terms of the Australian Code, I'm not sure because I'm not privy to that conversation, but I think it's close to being ready for public consultation. And I guess just to reiterate to the group, you know, get involved in that public consultation. Even if you look at it and think you like what's being done, make sure you speak up to express the fact that you're happy with it. Because um, otherwise the only voices we hear are the people that aren't happy. So make sure you're involved and you speak up for sort of useful and constructive change. No, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, the other question is, do you think researchers are better informed about ethical issues related to data management um, now than they were several years ago? Or do the same well, challenges remain? I mean, uh, once again, that's a really good question. I mean, one of the things, you know, if you're sort of uh, watching the media or if you've got the Google alert set up, you will have seen in the last, uh, over the course of the last couple of months, there was the um, emotional contagion, um, social media, um, I won't say fiasco, but um, problem. And there was also recently there's the OK Cupid one, which has sort of highlighted the fact that it's very easy for people to run into trouble. I think that there is a growing awareness, but I think that it's really important that institutions provide resource material to support researchers. I think that um, you know, we all need to work a lot harder in terms of making sure those resources are available. And I think, you know, I'm not talking about rule books. I'm not talking about a rule book about how to fill out an application form well. I'm talking about things that support the reflective practice of researchers. And hopefully that's something that we'll be seeing more of. But, you know, hey, there's a reciprocal obligation on researchers as well to avail themselves of those resources. Excellent. Thanks very much, Gary. That's all the questions. Oh, sorry, there's a comment here. Can you comment on data governance and whether you think data governance needs a national approach? What is your vision for this? And before I answer, I just want to reiterate again, I'm not speaking on behalf of the ARC or NHMRC or University of Australia. Look, I mean, I think that there is an argument to have a national reference point. I'm not saying that we need a um, you know, a national standard that we all have to apply, comply with, but I think that there is value to having a resource that's informing our practice. Um, so, you know, I think that that's a space that something can usefully be done. One of the reasons why uh, the four of us set up um, the RX web resources was to try and encourage some of that conversation between people. Fantastic. Thank you. I'll just clarify that that question came from Dr. Wee Ming Boone at the NHMRC. So maybe a conversation uh, continuing there. <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Angelica and I are going to talk through research data and how it best be managed, and we're going to talk a bit about more about our systems. So what we're going to cover is the principles and approach we've taken at UniSA. Um, I'll go into a bit how that fits into the research life cycle, 
and then we'll show a demonstration of how we bring together legal and ethical information so we can effectively manage research data throughout that life cycle. And then finally, I'll go, go through where we're going next with this capability. So the first thing with the principles and approach is that we've, wherever possible, we've tried to minister, minimise administrative overhead. The way that research and research data are moving means that more will be asked of researchers to support the sharing of research data. So wherever we can, we should try and reuse information and um, reduce those overheads for the researcher. We're also trying to do that for the support staff that support them. The other principle is that we are trying to maximise flexibility. So we use dynamic content wherever we can. An example of that is that we have an online human ethics application form which uh, our researchers use to uh, apply for ethics approval. We also support both physical and digital data. So the systems we've created aren't just about digital data, they're about physical objects and also about um, primary materials, whether that be uh, an artwork or um, blood samples, etc. We can point to where they are, uh, as well as pointing to the locations for digital data. The other important point with the digital data is that we allow for different versions of the same data. I'll give you an example. So if we have a have data that's non-identifiable data, that will be have different conditions attached to it to the identifiable data. So I've stolen an earlier version of Anne's life cycle diagram and that maps with our approach to managing the research data but we collect information throughout that life cycle so at the end we can dispose of it, archive it, etc. Our system, we, we have a research data management framework which sits in the centre of all this. The one exception that it doesn't touch is the reporting to funders because that is managed through our research administration systems but everywhere else it touches this uh, each element of the circle, the cycle I should say. So what does it look like? Um, research Master is our research administration system and that's where we have, for example, online human, human ethics applications and manage the research activities. Research details are passed through to our data management planning system and then uh, metadata is passed to our research metadata system which in turn puts information up to Research Data Australia. But importantly, we only pass that metadata that is releasable. So for various reasons, there are, we researchers may have information they don't want to share until they've completed their research project. So that's why I put the caveat on there that it has to be releasable. Below we have a data access portal and again the research metadata that's releasable is passed to the data access portal and there's a link from ANS back to our data access portal when data can be made open. So I wanted to show you what our data management planning system actually looks like. So this first screen is uh, a project details screen. Normally this would be pre-populated from Research Master, but for the purposes of this webinar, we've pre-populated a project. We've allowed the flexibility for, re for um, information to be entered as a project before it gets into Research Master and also for data to come across from Research Master. So in here we can, set, we can enter all the standard sort of information about the research project. Importantly down the bottom here, there's a confidentiality setting so that if for whatever reason the project has to be confidential, either for, private, either for um, contractual or because of um, some other condition that the researcher wants to manage. We then have inf information about the legal aspects of the activity, which is in our IP storage and security. So in here we can put in um, what conditions are in the project contract and that may be a funding agreement, uh, contract or um, other legal document. So here we can summarise the information that we get from that. So we get the ownership of the data, in this case I've clicked that it's solely owned by the university, but we can add other parties to this as well. So we could say jointly owned by the university and other, add other organisations. We can also say that the data created by the, by the project is subject to particular intellectual property conditions. And that includes both the project uh, IP, 
but also importantly, in my view, background and third party IP in that it provides a record of those aspects related to the research project. We then have the rights and restrictions and this is where we can set uh, licensing conditions relating to that research project. So for example, up here I've put a conditional access with access to the data requires an ethics approval. So this particular project we're assuming um, requires, uh, can include some uh, participant surveys or something along those lines. We then have the ability to add embargoes and we can add multiple embargoes. What we do as a default is we set the embargo to be completion of the project plus one year and that's just to allow enough time for the researchers to complete their publication activity and to basically do any housekeeping they need to do on the data before they um, share it. Now the embargo can be just because we've set it to the length of project plus a year, if the researcher has a need, we can actually um, change that embargo period so that the metadata, for example, can be released. And finally, related to, to ethics, we have a retention tab. And in this retention area, we can identify how long, as a minimum, the data must be held. So, for example, by default, it's set to five years. And I should say that these conditions are driven by both the uh, Australian Code and also the legislative requirements of the State of South Australia. So the uh, record keeping requirements of the State of South Australia are taken into account in here. If for example I, I select a clinical trial, then the retention period is set to 15 years. However, if I set that it also contains gene therapy, for example, then the retention period is set to permanent. So in this way, um, we're trying to keep it as simple as possible, but for example, this retention period information is used by our IT department to make sure that the records are retained. And then just below that, this is where we can record where the data created by the project is stored. So in this case, firstly, there's a physical um, location which for example, I've chosen the three drawer filing cabinet, which is, happens to be in a particular building, on a particular floor, in a particular room. Similarly, we can have a, a, a URL for, for this example, I've chosen a, a, um, a uh, SharePoint site. So just to remind you, this shows you, again, the framework that we've created. And where we're going from here is that we want to make the relationship between online ethics and the data management planning system more integrated. So to do this we intend to create a cross-link which will allow, for example, if there's a data management plan that that can be, uh, the information from that data management plan can be used to populate the human ethics application so that they don't have to, the researcher doesn't have to re-enter that information. Conversely, if they've entered information in the human ethics application, we want to import that into the data management planning system so that we don't have to double enter that. We have held off on this crosslink because of the changes that have been made at the NHMRC with the Human Research uh, Ethics Application form. Thank you. Okay, well thank you for um, asking me to talk today. Um, I probably come from a, a different approach uh, compared to the uh, previous two um, presenters that I'm more systems based person. What I want to um, take you through today is a trial that we're putting together here at RMIT that we think might help academics actually uh, deal with the issue of data storage. So with, with most um, higher education providers in Australia, we have a, a data storage policy um, and the onus is very much on the academic to, to comply with the policy. They're expected to complete their data plan, etc. But very little support is actually provided to the academic to comply with the policy. Um, and again, as with most higher education providers in Australia, we have software, in our case it's Redbox, which is uh, meant to assist the academics in actually bringing together their, their data around their research projects, their outputs and the actual uh, data they've used underpinning the research. But at the moment, uh, Redbox, the way we've implemented here at MIT, requires the academic to go in and pull this um, information together. And most of our academics quite bluntly tell us that they've um, got better things to do. 
So our plan is to actually assist them uh, actually bringing this stuff together. At RMIT, we use Research Master to capture all information regarding our funded research projects. And for us, it provides um, some very rich metadata. We have metadata on the chief investigators on a project, uh, the, the fund source, uh, the amounts awarded, the description of the research, um, our FLR codes, uh, descriptions of the research, etc. And whenever a research agreement is signed at RMIT, that's whether it's competitive or contract, um, a record is created in Research Master by staff in our research innovation portfolio, which is the equivalent of research offices, I suppose, around Australia. What our teams also do is they open up what's called work breakdown structure in the SAP system, which is essentially a research account. And this is where all of the finance information is actually processed. Our view is that our research office staff can also allocate storage space at this point. As with our colleagues at, at UniSA, we use Research Master to capture all information regarding our funded research projects. And for us, it provides rich metadata. So we know who the chief investigators are, where our funding sources are from, the amounts awarded, our descriptions of the research, the fields of research, etc. So whenever a research agreement is signed at RMIT, and it goes through a process of being signed by our DVC R&I, this is whether it's competitive or contract research. Um, a record's created in Research Master by staff in our research innovation portfolio, which is essentially uh, the same as a research office anywhere else. And what we also do is we also open up a research account in our SAP system, which is called a work breakdown structure over here at RMIT. And what we've been thinking about is really our research staff could also be allocating storage space at the same time. So what we're intending to do is with a very small sample of um, academics, and that's our most recent ARC linkage recipients. Um, we're going to run a bit of a trial using Cloud Store, which is uh, run by RNET, where the research office will actually allocate storage for these projects. The advantage being, one, that Cloud Store offers uh, 100 gigabytes of data per academic and very easy to use. So um, we can drop and drag into folders. Um, it's web based, so then it's transferable. And what we'll then do is we'll record that URL in uh, research master. So then what we do have is we've actually matched the metadata up to where the storage is actually, um, where the data is actually being stored. We can then push this back into Redbox, etc. And then at least we know for any given particular research project, or at least the, the ARC linkage ones, we'll know where the, the actual data is stored. So our plan is to at least try this with our ARC and NH NHMRC funded research and then hopefully roll this out as a, as a growing, or well, something that we can roll out into our other types of research. So um, we'll be very interested to see how our, our trial progresses. It'll be a bit of a change for our academics who are used to basically storing their data where they feel they'd like to. It's stored in all sorts of weird and wonderful places since we've, we've done a few audits around the place. And um, so what we hope to do is actually change the culture a little bit. One, to make it maybe put a bit of trust in the research office that we're not trying to do anything evil with their research or anything with the data, but just at least that first step of being able to curate it and know where it is. So for us, it's the start of a, a very long and hopefully fun ride, but I'm sure we'll be having some, um, some scary moments along the way. And that's it for me. Thank you, Jim. So the first question is, will you store human participant data in Cloud Store? Um, this is one of the things we're, we're looking at um, in terms of the, the, so one of the things we are doing is we're going to meet with Arnett to, to talk about um, storing data, but we, we think we probably could. We do know that it is being used um, currently for a lot of um, research projects around the place, but obviously too we want to make sure that um, anything we put up there is secure. The next question, when does the trial finish? Do you plan on sharing your results? Yes, we'd love to share the results. So our trial starting now, so um, we've only got, as I said, we only had eight ARC linkage recipients in the last round which we thought was a nice little um, group to work with. So we're in the process at the moment of actually putting together the, um, we've actually sort of written up the process of how we think this will work. And then basically the, the agreements for linkage projects normally take a little bit longer due to the participation agreements being signed off. So we expect it probably be later in the year when the, the research actually starts. So that, that's at the point that we'll actually be allocating the, the storage on Cloud Store. And then yes, we'll definitely, um, uh, happy to share the results of how that goes. Thank you. Our question, does this mean that a successful pilot would lead to RMIT storing all research data on Cloud Store? That is something that's a potential at the moment. Um, probably what we're more interested in is just the concept of um, would academics be happy with us all allocating storage space? Cloud Store is a very quick solution for us because um, it's, it's in the cloud, we can actually allocate the 
as in we, as in the, the research office can allocate the storage on behalf of the academic and it doesn't involve us having to um, invest in the infrastructure. We do have to see whether we'd actually run out of storage space on Cloud Store and um, we also need to figure out what we would do with Arnet stops, etc. But the plan is at least to, to have a, a system where all data storage is allocated centrally by the research office. Okay, thank you. Will there be any business to business connectivity between Cloud Store and Research Master at RMIT or is that a manual workflow? At the moment it's a manual workflow. Okay, thank you. How are issues of data privacy and security managed in Cloud Store? So the same thing again, it's it's the Cloud Store, think of it as something similar to, to Google Drive, so the, the academic actually gets to control who has access to the data. Um, at the moment our main point of having this record centrally is so we just at least know where the data is. And again, this is the, the issues we'll have to um, negotiate as we go forward. But our, our first port of call, well, what we actually want to get out of the trial is uh, will academics use it and also can we actually have a system where centrally a research office would know at least where all the story, where the data is stored for a given research project. And who decides what's star stored in that cloud store location? I, is yeah, I think the that, chief investigator responsible or will all data relating to the project be mandated? Yep. I think, again, this is probably what we're looking at our policy. We, we're not expecting researchers to use Cloud Store uh, for their, I suppose, their transitional data. We just do want it at the end of the project. Um, so whether that's just the data they do the analysis on, etc. Primary materials, I think that we probably haven't even gone down that path yet. But the plan is, yeah, that the chief investigator would be the person responsible for ensuring that the data is actually in Cloud Store. Thanks. And could Cloud Store be used to make data publicly available at the end of the research project? Um, as we understand, it does connect up to things like TARDIS, so there is the potential of bringing that data back down. And I suppose that's the next step we're looking at as well, is working with our, our various areas. Um, I suppose our point of view is, as long as we know it, where it is, it then can be distributed to um, you know, wherever it needs to go. <coughs> There's a question. Our academics, um, I think this is from Sharon Wise at UTS, our academics use Cloud Store via AIA of their own initiative. Is there a management console where you can allocate space? This is what we've been um, sort of playing with the last couple of weeks is basically just setting up our own accounts and then seeing and sharing and etc. So this is, this is one of the things where we often meet with Arnett about is um, actually getting that administrative space, administrative space um, sorted out for us. Okay. Is the data stored in Cloud Store physically located in Australia and governed by Australian legislation and privacy requirements? Yes, yes it is. Yeah, that was a that was a major concern for us, so yes it is. Yeah. Yeah, great answer there. <laughs> um, question to Jim, but also to the other panellists. Is there a role for the library in this project? Oh, definitely for us because from our point of view, we're not in the, um, the business of actually um, I suppose pushing the, the data out, etc. So that next step of getting the data into a repository or pushing that data out, that doesn't really sit in our remit. So definitely there's a role for us with the library. And we actually very I work very closely with the library with that sort of model. So for instance our uh, publications repository, the publications all come through our team and um, are collected for ERA, obviously no longer heard C. Um, and other purposes, but then we actually push that data through to the repository where they manage the, the repository side of things and we'd be seeing that our research data would be treated in the same way. Hey, would any of the other panellists like to comment on the role of the library in the work that they do? Oh, I'd, I'd say in terms of in thinking about um, professional development and support for early career researchers and HDR candidates, I think actually the library's got an extremely important role. So. I mean, I think it's very important to have a good partnership between the ethics and integrity team and the library because quite often they're on the front line for providing advice to those researchers. So things like them identifying um, a reputable place to be publishing their work or thinking about a data repository, I think the, the library can play a very important role. In, in our particular case, we see the, we're, we're effectively a triumvirate. So the library are involved, so we put get together the research project information, but then that's passed for the, to the library to basically help assist researchers with uh, enriching. enriching with their data set information and also um, 
you know, through the life of the project. So in other words, when the project completes, they meet with the researcher to finalise their data to then we look at open access, etc. So it's very much uh, a joint venture, a three-legged stool, if you like, between I, our um, IT area, the research office and library. Thank you. Um, and there's a question also for Glenn and Angelica. Uh, you mentioned you would like to link uh, you would like to better integrate ethics with data management plans. So how do you, you envisage the process of doing this? For example, will the ethics application be completed at the same time as the data management plan or how do those things link? As I, was, uh, as I said in the presentation, I think, we, if the data management plan should logically occur before the ethics application, if um, researchers have done their data management planning, however, we've got to allow for the possibility that that's not the case. So we're taking it from either direction. So if there's a data management plan, then that can be the information from that data management plan can be imported into their ethics application, and we do that by linking through their project. The other way is if they don't yet have a data management plan, we can extract the information from their ethics application and use it in our data management planning system. Thank you very much. A question from Jackie Stevens at Notre Dame. Not an ethical related question per se, but we are looking at research management software at the moment. Will Research Master not provide a storage solution as well? Question. If not, is there any software to manage workflow, storage and archiving? I'm wondering Pigshare.com. I thought CloudStore has limitations on archiving. Question mark. I can answer firstly with respect to Research Master, they can provide a link to a storage location, but they're not a they're not even really a document store. So that's not really the role that the res that Research Master provide. It's a purely an administrative system. That, yeah. Um, so we don't we certainly don't see us doing that. It's more of a like like Jim said, provide having a URL link to the location. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else want to comment on that? Okay, there's a question for Jim. Um, is your pilot a joint venture with Arnet? We're off to meet with Arnet to see, um, basically to take those next steps. But I mean, that's something we've we're just been pushing out ourselves at the moment in the research office. Um, and basically just playing around in cloud store in-house here and um, pretending we're researchers ourselves and setting up our own, sending storage to each other and uploading into it. So um, we're obviously going to meet with them and keep them aware of what we're doing, but it's our own initiation, really, our own initiative, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, is cloud store data encrypted in transit and on cloud? Again, these are the questions that we need to talk to, um, to Arnett about. Okay, thank you. And a question for Glenn again. Is Uni of SA using an in-house developed data management plan integrated with Research Master or some independent solution? No, it's definitely an in-house developed um, data management planning system and it is integrated with Research Master as well as our human resources system. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've come to, oh, sorry, did you want to? I just wanted to say that we do pass through to Redbox and Mint. So. Yeah, we harvest, so Redbox and Mint does harvest data from the system as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've actually come to the end of the list of questions, so if uh, you've participated today and you think of a question later or I've missed yours in the pod because there are a lot of them that came through, um, please um, contact Paul and we can we can pass the question on to the panellists. So oh, oh, sorry, one more. Yeah. I've got one more. Sorry, <laughs> just came through. What are your views on requirements for researchers to release their data as part of publication? So I'll, I'll, I'll give a view in terms of that. So, I mean, we are seeing... Um, journals increasingly saying that they want to see the data and that's part of that, so I guess the verification process. I think if the ethics is looked after, uh, I think it's actually a, a good thing. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about um, you know, participants who are vulnerable or we're talking about risky research, basically having the data available to others, uh, I think there's strong eth ethical arguments to sharing, um, but you know, if a journal is asking for it, just thinking through that sort of confidentiality side of things and, and the ethics is just really important. We provide support for the attachment of data or the sharing of data as part of the publication process and we look at it being a data set to support that publication. So it may not be, it will be, could well be part of the broader data set or a number of data sets that relate to the project but 
we allow for the fact that the researchers can pull that together to support their publication. But really it's up to the researcher and the ethics approval, et cetera, to manage that release together with us. Yep, basically the, the same thing that the, the two previous um, speakers just mentioned. Um, one of the things we are looking at long term now is actually trying to um, capture the whole life cycle of research. So um, when we're looking now at, again, if I use the ARC example, we know where the, the data is actually stored. What we're also starting to do now is relate our publications back to the funding source. So I think in time what we'll, I can see a situation where what we want to be able to do is measure research from idea probably through to impact and all the steps along the way. And I think um, relating publications back to projects, back to data sets will be something that we'll definitely be doing here at RMIT. Thank you all our panel members. Thank you for, um, for attending today's webinar.